Hello and welcome to Pitt Street Research. My name is Stuart Roberts. I'm one of the founders of our firm and with me is Dr. James Garner of Casia Therapeutics. James, welcome to Pitt Street Research. Stuart, it's great to be here. Thanks yes. for having me. Now, I am particularly excited about this interview. Um, your colleagues have attended the Society for Neuro-Oncology meeting in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Not a meeting I've had the privilege of going to. Um, but Casia had some particularly good news there. Uh, particularly for anyone out there who, who, who has um, uh, glioblastoma, the brain cancer, or may have. Talk to us about what you've, you've got to announce at that meeting. Yes, yeah, it's, it's been great news, actually. Really exciting development for our drug. Right. Uh, we've been looking at our drug, GDC84, yes. in glioblastoma, the most right. common and the most aggressive form of brain cancer. Right. And uh, this is early data from a phase two study. So the yes. study is still ongoing. We've still got much more to come. But on the, on the first group of patients, the first eight patients in the study, we've shown a progression-free survival of about 8.3 months, right. which compares very favorably uh, to any sort of benchmark for this disease. Right. And we've got a number of the patients, in fact, still on the drug, still, still being treated, so, uh, and more patients being recruited as, as we speak. So um, it's an early glimpse, but it's a really clear signal in our mind that this drug is fundamentally working and uh, and so, so that's that's great news to get at such an early data readout right so um, if one is unfortunate enough to get glioblastoma generally your life expectancy is about 12 months if I recall yeah that's uh, correct John, John McCain for example mm. uh, by the great American Senate mm. that was about his his uh, life expectancy that's from start right. to finish I, th I think um, however you're not in a position to talk about life expectancy. Your patients haven't hit the overall survival mark yet, have they? That's correct. And in, right. in, a, in a way, that's almost the more exciting data, although right. it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's sort of hard to interpret at this stage. Um, out of those first eight patients, six of them are still alive at the time of analysis, three right. quarters of them. So we haven't hit the median. We right. haven't hit the halfway mark yet. But we have had uh, a, at least one of those patients now is, is still on treatment 16 months after starting. Okay. Yeah. So we're really starting to get a sense that these patients are living longer than we would expect. Sure. Now, now we can't technically call it yet because yes. uh, until we reach that halfway point, it's, it's, it's difficult to know what happens next. But, um, but it's certainly looking that way. And if we were to show a survival benefit from this drug, on just eight patients of data, that would be incredible. Very, very few cancer drugs are able sure. to demonstrate that sort of effect on such a small group of patients. So we're going to be watching that really, really closely. Yes. Now, I've been following Casio uh, for about two and a half years now. Mm. Now, uh, what's interesting about your drug, not all glioblastoma is the same. Some mm. is treatable uh, with uh, the standard of care drug, uh, temozolomide, with mm. radiation. Some aren't. And the, 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 the differentiating point is, is a, a little biomarker called MGMT. Mm. Now, you raised the bar. You, you treated MGMT methylated patients. Now, stick with us, uh, viewers. This is important. Um, uh, MGMT meth, 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 methylated uh, patients, and they're, they're the ones who generally have no treatment effect uh, with temozolomide, and you've actually extended the progression-free survival of those patients. Mm. So, so um, if you can hear the champagne uh, corks popping open, in Phoenix, that's what people are celebrating, right? So that, that's right. It's, it's right. The, the unmethylated patients, the ones that, that are resistant to right. temozolomide. Right. And that's about two-thirds of the patients. Yes. So it's the majority of patients. Yes. For those patients, temozolomide, the only existing FDA-approved therapy, adds a matter of weeks of, of progression for right. survival. So very roughly, it extends PFS from about 4.4 to 5.3 months, okay. which is, is not, a, not a great difference. Now, in that exact group of patients, that's where we've been examining GDC84, so these patients who are resistant to temozolomide, yes. and that's where we're seeing 8.4 months as, as our progression-free survival. Um, so it really looks like we're, we're really just in a different orbit from the existing standard of care. And, uh, and as I say, these are the patients for whom there just are no existing treatment right. options. Now, you've spent a lot of time looking at the, um, at the universe of potential uh, drugs in development mm. for glioblastoma. And you know, hand on, on whatever holy book you choose, your opinion is that you're leading the field in terms of the, the, most, uh, the leading uh, candidate in the clinic headed towards a potential outcome. 
Should I? I think that's I think that's a fair judgment of the situation. You know, there's there's certainly other drugs in development for right. brain cancer, as as there are for every form of cancer, and uh, different companies are looking at different subgroups of the population, looking at using their drugs in different ways. But if you look at and and about every six months or so, we sort of do a survey of the landscape and see what else is out there. We're certainly not aware of anybody else who has a drug candidate that is more advanced than GDC84 that is reporting better data in this patient group and in this way of using the drug and is, is currently in active development. Sure, sure. So so we, we think that GDC84 has every opportunity of every possibility of being the next drug approved for this disease. Obviously, things can change, yes. but uh, but we, we do think we've got really at least one of the most exciting drugs in the global pipeline for right. this disease. Now, when you in the the drug, it was interesting. Um, <clears throat> people have talked for years about the so-called PI3K inhibitor mm. class. There was already one uh, approved, and at the time I first discovered you, a second had come along. Now, mm. there are four drugs in that class. None of them are, are uh, available above the blood-brain barrier where you could go after glioblastoma. Mm. Yours does. Mm. So talk to us about what's important about PI3K as a class that you belong to. Yeah, Stuart, it, it's been really interesting to watch the, uh, the the evolution of this class of drugs. So the, the PI3K inhibitor class, I think it's it's fair to say when we brought in this drug, it was there, there was a little bit of a question mark hanging sure. over the class, whether, whether this was really going to turn into a, a good way of treating cancer. There are now four FDA-approved drugs right. in this class. Three of them approved since we brought in the drug. Yeah, and, yeah. and I think Novartis we, just got one approved a little while ago. That's for correct. Yeah, right. Novartis just, yep. just had Picray approved. Very, very exciting drug. Real blockbuster potential. And so, um, so, so this is really now a mainstream part of the, the, the toolkit for treating cancer. I, th- I think this is very, very well validated, very well understood, and very well respected as a, as a, as a class of drugs. The unique thing about our drug is it's the only one that crosses the blood-brain barrier. It's right. the only drug that can get into the brain. So it's really the only one of this group of drugs that's got any chance of being a brain cancer drug. And so we, one of the things we love about the drug is it's got this validation, this, um, this, this fact of being a proven quantity by virtue of the other drugs out there, but it's got this unique selling point that separates it from everything else. Yes. Now, for the investors who are wondering how you can build a, a, a strong company out of uh, such a rare disease as glioblastoma, let, let's talk about the economics. Mm. Um, uh, there's, there's perhaps 20,000 patients in the United States? That, that's probably somewhere around that ballpark. Right. Typically 12 to 15 okay. is, is the annual incidence in the U.S., right. and then about, about 20 maybe in prevalence. Okay, yeah. okay. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, if we price that, say, at $100,000 a year mm. per patient, we're talking potentially a $2 billion uh, market opportunity currently untapped at the moment. So that, that's, that's correct. I mean, certainly we conservatively tend to talk of this as being about a billion and a half dollar market. Right. Um, but, but that probably is conservative. Right. And, um, and that's been the experience with a lot of these less common cancers. I mean, for example, when Gleevec was approved yes. for GIST, gastrointestinal yes. stromal yes. tumor, uh, it's a relatively rare cancer. A lot of people said, you know, how on earth can that be commercially viable? Well, that was including a, the CEO at the time. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and that was a billion dollar product. Right. So, um, uh, More than that, $6 billion before well, that. Well, exactly. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Ex- exactly. Very, very successful product. And, and so, um, so there's, there's no question in our mind that this is a very commercially attractive opportunity for the drug. And glioblastoma isn't necessarily the limit for us because uh, we do see the opportunity to use the drug in other forms of brain cancer. We actually have four other clinical trials ongoing. Right. And potentially that could extend its use into, into a much, much wider group of patients. And uh, so really, in terms of the commercial opportunity that represents, the sky's the limit. Sure. Now, James, you've owned this drug now for about three years. It had a pretty good provenance. You licensed it from the great Genentech. Uh, so mm. uh, it, it had a good beginning, and you've obviously taken it forward now. Now, it was always your intention to look for a partner at some stage, mm. you know, given the cost of, of late-stage drug development is prohibitive for many companies. Um, is it fair to say now that you're beginning to get uh, ahead of steam behind this drug that uh, the phone is, is uh, set to ring a little bit with potential partners? Yeah, it's true. Look, I, I think it's it's certainly uh, entering a really interesting phase. I think our strategy as a company, the way we've always conceived Casio, is a bit like a biotech version of the real estate model of, of buying a slightly rundown house on a really good street and, right. and doing it up and, right. and then and then selling it on. 
And, um, and I think our assumption has always been that, that ultimately the destination for this drug would be to partner it out to right. a larger company for commercialization. The question of when is the right time to do that is, is something that, that's always arguable. I mean, I think we, we certainly have a pretty active discussion ongoing with a number of companies, but, uh, but on the other hand, we, we want to make sure that we, uh, we, we do this in such a way that it maximizes value for our shareholders. So there's no doubt nothing lubricates these discussions like data. And I think the data we've just announced will be uh, will, will be uh, a basis for a lot of interesting discussions. But but we'll we'll see where those discussions okay. take us. Now, um, obviously, very early days. We're, we're we're doing an interim analysis on the first eight patients. Sure. There's 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 more where that came from, and that just completes phase two. So it'll be some time before we 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 uh, really start. Uh, to talk about this drug being available for patients. But it's fair to say you're excited to where, where, you're, where you're sitting at right now. Yes, yeah, look, I, th- I think we're thrilled. I, th- I think, uh, you know, this this has considerably exceeded our expectations at this right. stage. And I, I've been involved in the development of a lot of cancer drugs. And to have such a such a strong signal at this stage, I think, is is not common. Uh, you know, we're usually at this stage looking at early tumor response data and yeah. trying to pick apart biomarkers and things like that. But to have this this sort of quality of data is uh, is is very much a pleasant surprise. And uh, there is more to come. There's another 20 patients being enrolled in yes. the study, which we're, and it's it's recruiting well. So I think hopefully we'll we'll start to see that data uh, before too long. And, and I think then that invites the question, well, what is next for the drug? How do we take it forward into a larger pivotal study to, to look towards registration? And that may not be a very long time away. Right. So, uh, so I, th- I think we're, uh, we're at the very exciting end of the, the development of this drug. Okay. Well, Dr. James Garner, well done for you and your colleagues. You've done a great work for the, um, for the folks who are um, uh, suffering from glioblastoma right now and those who will. And you're looking after your shareholders. So uh, keep up the good work. Sure. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you.